Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this event. Uh, my, my name is Helen Starr, and uh, I am a cultural activist. Um, I'm the founder of the Mechatronic Library, and I um, also recently founded um, Dard Futurism with Salma Nur and Amrita Dalu. Um, I'm going to now start my presentation, uh, which will take us uh, through the event. Um, so just to let everyone know, this webinar will be recorded and published on the Photom microsite at a later date. Live audio captioning can be enabled via closed captions at the bottom of your screen. Captions will not be 100% accurate due to the nature of the AI technology. This is a safe space. Please be respectful and refer to our safe space guidelines on the Photom website. Comments and questions are encouraged via the Q&A and the chat box. Video lounges are available afterwards to continue on these conversations. You will be linked via the chat towards the end of the webinar. Um, I would like to say this is an amazing feature and I will be uh, in the video lounge for an hour after this presentation. So if anyone would like to ask questions or continue the conversation, please do join me uh, there. The reading rooms are on the Photom website. Links and resources from the event will be shared there. For social, share your comments using the Photom UK. Um, remember to tag at Creative United UK. I would like to take this moment to thank very much Creative Scotland, Creative United, UCL, and the amazing Lucy Solit, without whom none of this would have happened. My presentation today is called the art market is structured like a plantation, and I have invited um, Salma Noor, who will be speaking instead of Sumaya Kader, Louise Clements, and um, oh, Farid Rakun from the Indonesian collective known as Ruin Grupa. I'd like to take the moment to say that there's a lot of information on the website if you would like to um, have a look at what Ruin Grupa do. There are short film clips um, on uh, the IGTV, and there are also uh, film clips uh, about the history of Liverpool, which is the city from which Salma Nur will be speaking from. So we're all very familiar with these figures. The UK's creative industries contributes almost 13 million to the UK economy every hour. New government figures shows the country's successful creative industries contributed 111 billion to the UK in 2018. The average salary in the UK per annum is 30,000. The minimum wage in the UK per annum is supposed to be 17,000. And yet the average artist salary in the UK every year um, rounds up at 6,000 a year. So we don't need to really discuss that there's a problem with the uh, economic uh, ecology of the art world. So the first plantations, were, were the plantations of Ireland. Um, these were spaces of retribution for rebellions against English rule during the 16th and 17th century. Punitive in nature, they enabled the planting of English settlers onto lands confiscated following the suppression of rebellions. This economic model spread throughout the British Empire and adapted itself to the first, second and third industrial revolutions. The third industrial revolution, of course, automated production. The product for cash plantation model squeezed 
local communities because workers no longer controlled how values symbolized by money circulated amongst themselves. Wealthy elites controlled the plantations and the laborers powered the system. The plantation itself served as an institution character characterized by social and political inequality and domination by the planter class. Money extracted from the colonies and now circulating at the imperial top powered research, innovation and the acquisition of fine goods. It is within this framework that the hegemonic art world and its art market sets. Now we are in the fourth industrial revolution. This revolution is fundamentally different to the others. It is characterized by a range of new technologies that are fusing the physical, digital, and biological worlds, impacting all disciplines, economies, and industries, and challenging ideas about what it means to be human and how to act in a way which benefits oneself or not. At the heart of the fourth industrial revolution is the ability to allow value stored as information to leak past the dominant authorities. Collaborations can arise across geographies, cultures and disciplines. Communities can form based on shared interests. Across cultural, linguistic, ethnic, race and gender difference, new networks are being built. And out of these new networks, new markets will form. Some of us will replicate the old extractive models online and off. Some of us will replicate the old competitive winner take all models. And some of us will move towards a new futurism based on community and care towards what I like to call a poetic anarchy. So here we have an example, which always makes me laugh, of someone's idea of art and technology and being a really good example of futurism. This is not at all where my personal practice is based. Um, I consider myself a, a cultural activist and it is within this idea of myself and my ontology that I frame all of my projects and I will speak about two in particular now. So the first project um, that I curated and helped produce was uh, that I'll speak about is called Why Can't We Do This in IRL? It's a VR installation by Megan Broadmeadow and it was scored by an amazing grime artist from Liverpool called uh, Blue Saint. The, there's a, a paper on it in the Fotum Library, so you can follow up on it after the presentation. And here I like to pull on the words of my wonderful co-curator for this project, Lucia Aris, who writes, in 2019, Helen Starr joined FACTS team. She challenged our perception of ourselves, both institutionally and as agents in the community, through our language, verbal and non-verbal, and our behaviours. Time constraints and capacity are intrinsic to the arts, as we know, sticking to production timelines related to exhibitions. She introduced us to liming, a get together with loose informal time constraints, the Trinidadian understanding of time. It gave permission to value the time we put into thinking about participants and our duty of care towards them. Why can't we do this in IRL is the result of our shared interests in how we understand the dominant systems of control. It questions the responsibility of mass media and the video game industry in perpetuating those systems. As Helen put it, Virtual AI and digital systems are no longer modeling physical reality. They are shaping the way we behave and act with or without our knowledge and consent. 
They are transferring behaviors from a predatory colonial past into the present and future. They are reshaping us as humans. Do we allow it? Do we find another path? Helen also reminds us that the best manifesto of the duty of care is the artwork itself. As a curator being cited in Liverpool where personhood history has intersected across gender and race, allowed for a project around one of the most important current philosophical debates, namely the personhood of sentient AI and what should be our duty of care towards a creature of such difference, if, as we claim, we are committed to not repeating the mistakes of past history. And thinking about how to not repeat the mistakes of the colonial past, again, can be found in um, a work by Anna Bunting Branch, which was scored by Alia Hussein produced by myself. It was a uh, virtual reality work and it can be viewed on um, the website. Um, it's a, a gift, if you like, to the rest of the world. It's, it's, it's posted there so my family in Trinidad can enjoy what I do. And uh, this is around the idea of world building. And here I'll quote from the amazing Peter Bonnell, um, who is like my brother in arms. Um, Peter says, it is world building. It is also a term becoming, as I write this text in early May 2020, increasingly strident and urgent in our thinking as the world considers emerging from the coronavirus pandemic. No longer are we to go back to normal, but to a new normal, to rebuild the world again. The real trick in any form of world building is getting the cosmology right, not just simply using the technology, but using it with purpose and ambition. And I would like to say that I'm very privileged in working with the artists that I get to work with because they all use technology with purpose, with ambition to tell stories which we believe can change the world. I'll end with a, a quote on futurism from the great Marcel Duchamp who says, let us consider two important factors, the two poles of the creation of the art, the artist on one hand and on the other, the spectator who, who later becomes the posterity. And now we begin um, with one of my most amazing panelists, Louise. Uh, Clements and Louise will introduce herself and uh, talk to you about her project. Hi, and um, thanks for everyone joining us today. Thank you to Lucy, uh, Angela behind the scenes, and Helen, and all our fellow speakers as well. And um, so I'm just going to try my best to share the screen. Here we go. Screen share. Helen, you need to stop sharing your screen first. And then I will share mine. There we go. <laughs> Thanks. Cool. It's like a little tango on the on the screens here. Here we go. And full screen. Does that look nice? I hope it does. Okay, cool. Um, so just to introduce myself. Um, I my heritage. I'm uh, from an Armenian. Um, family roots by Egypt um, from refugee family and raised in the UK and I'm a curator and director writer performer producer juggling mo multiple things gardener mother all these things and um, so I've been at Quad since 2002 we opened the building in um, 2008 here I'm the artistic director but I'm also the director of format which I set up in 2004 
So Quad is a Centre for Contemporary Art and Film. We're a non-profit, we're a charity. We organise exhibitions, festivals, film, photography, commissions, residencies, give artists space and time to develop their own ideas. My programme team has exhibition curators. Peter is one of them, we got to mention earlier. Um, Helen is, is kindly on our board and one of our greatest advisors and uh, mentors and moral supporters. And um, been a, a great strength to us, um, me personally, over this um, really uh, extraordinary time of, of the pandemic. Um, so we have participation curators, education curators, well-being learning um, curators. We also have expertise in new media, in interest and practice, um, the technology, um, multiple projects under our belt in VR, AR, 360, and all kinds of different interactive medias and more but our ethos at the root of all of this is really focused on intercultural dialogue enabling the culture of ecology um practicing participatory um projects and ideas and theories and testing that with the world and the society around us uh, we're socially engaged as much as we can be we support residencies i really love um thinking and being challenged by helen's thoughts on liming and uh, allowing and enabling artists and all people actually, all human beings, time to think, um, not only to be creative, but to think and to be and to, to uh, manifest. Um, we're about well-being, we're about supporting and developing, about confidence building, about network development, empowerment, relationship building, directing people towards resources and facilitating collective structures and learning from them as well. On the whole, we work outside of the formal art market, but the art market often does come to us and we flirt with it, and it does. Um, we're an institution, we are gatekeepers, if you like, but um, we give out the keys <laughs> to the people and we trust artists to use them well. And of course, this opens us up to chaos and disruption and change, but we facilitate and um, embrace that. Um, and of course, there's privilege in this autonomy and this, this way of working. We're an independent arts organization, which absolutely is um, grateful for the support from public funding. Without that, of course, other survival strategies are necessary. But money is always a relentless challenge. But independent thought and practice is absolutely possible within and, in, within and outside of the dominant structures. So we are open again in our centre in Derby. Um, these are a couple of exhibitions that we have on now, which is Atkin at the top, who's an artist from Turkey, and he's looking at um, AI systems, and he's created this really stunning, immersive um, multi-screen installation. And Mimi Onoha, who's got this, uh, she's got film installation, but also has this um, risograph print, and she's looking at data discrimination and Um, here's some more exhibition views. We, we show all kinds of different work and experiment with different platforms. The top right image is a, a view through to a season of failure that we curated that um, spanned across the entire year, but um, this exhibition focused on it specifically, a failure as, in a, as a creative, uh, an impossible thing to avoid and something to learn from, and it's part of all our creative. Um, and Team Lab is a really stunning interactive show uh, by an incredible team of collaborative technologists based in, in Japan. Um, also, we collaborated Mar with Marinella Sanatori, who is an artist, she's a nomadic artist, she's based all over the world. She, she grew up, her roots are in Italy, but she works with entire communities um, of uh, miners village in, uh, in, in the mountains in Italy or the entirety of the Bronx and we invited her to come and work with uh, close to three, 300,000 people in Derby one year and we got close to having directly 15,000 participants to produce three films with um, collaborative organizations and teams in Madrid and Berlin and Derby and the actors traveled between sign language was a key feature of the, of the project people contributed the sandwich to, sandwiches to the set, they made the curtains, they did the artwork that was in the background, they made the set, we turned the gallery into a set for a number of months. It was used for the filming, people wrote the script, they did the storyline, they acted in it. All the parts of the film we broke down into multiple, multiple um, 
pieces and shared skills and people learn so much. And this was a truly transformative project that really has repercussions and a legacy through to today. We've got young people who were part of that project then if they're growing up to be uh, fully and doing sound or major cinema productions internationally. And, you know, we still meet people in the city that were, were part of this incredible project. So um, we collaborated with three other organizations, New Art Exchange and Beacon Projects, and one Salisbury Street to um, have a pavilion in Venice in 2015. But alongside that, we commissioned an artist called Chan Candice Jacobs, especially we're talking about the art market. And she came up with this proposal to work with 40 artists to commission each one of them to make a screensaver, whether it's a GIF or a video or a still image. Um, it was uploaded to this website that's still accessible. You could curate the screen yourself. You could download the images and collect the artworks and own them and have them on your screens. We also produced a geocache guide to Venice where you could walk around and find the hidden, hidden stories that we curated and manipulated with artists involved, but also find um, additional artworks in hidden locations geographically in, in this in the space of Venice as you as you walked around, which is amazing. And other example of, of this kind of collaborative practice and uh, kind of being a bit slightly renegade in the, in the art system is working with Juno projects. And we opened up uh, our gallery space and invited everybody and anybody to propose ideas to us. We uh, selected down to 150. Uh, it was all kinds of projects happened within the space, um, enormous amount of liveliness and uh, <laughs> anarchy. But alongside that, we're, we match -made, we were matchmakers on putting projects together. So for example, um, a voluntary ambulance brigade wanted to do um, first aid training <laughs> randomly in the space, but also a, a contemporary performance art group and a sh contemporary Shakespeare company also wanted to practice and do performance. So we put them together and they made a made a show called Emergency Shakespeare where all the stabbings and the <laughs> and the cuttings and the near near death experiences were tended to by the local ambulance uh, brigade. Anyway, we're moving on. But uh, all kinds of different ways of working. We're always disrupting what we do and what's possible. So there's a couple of projects where here's also just an example of our international work. So from communities and our autistic young people and families and supporting them to have the resources to continue working with us throughout the pandemic and crowdsource funding to, to do um, So Format is one of the, it's not just a project, it's a major biennial, it's, um, <clears throat> it's coming up next year. So previously in 2019, we focused on Forever Now, which is looking at the and next year, we're looking at control in a multiple um, multiple viewpoints on that on that that theory or theme. So, format is a multidisciplinary international festival. Uh, photography is the medium focus, but it's not about photography. I founded Format in two thousand and four, and that's the same year as Web two point zero began, where people could represent themselves online. It's also when Facebook and other social media sites began to. To work, it was a dawning of a new age for people communicating globally. Um, format is inherently in a similar way to Quad because I look after both. It's socially engaged, participatory. We have major international portfolio review, which I'll mention in a minute. Produce publications. We have up to 300 artists showing per edition. We're based in Derby, but work all over the world: Singapore, China, Uganda, Nigeria, Poland, and many, many other places. Um, and of course, rooted locally. And more, we have a year-round program of commissions, residencies, mentoring, conference, and all the, the fruit of the fair of an excellent biennial. Um, we recently received a major grant to develop an online presentation space, which uh, uh, will be a gallery of sorts, but we're working with games designers and coder to bring to life as part of the research um, and also engage practice online and trying to find a way for fulfilling social engagement, if that is possible, um, so people can have a, have some kind of relationship, potentially through avatars, but uh, 
keep an eye on our information for what we what we make out of that. Much of our work is certainly grassroots with artists all over the world and we share the small resources that we do have and expertise that we have to support autonomy and create self sufficient legacies. That's the aim and we want to allow artists to be individual individual and not slave to the market. So the portfolio review takes place every year and um, we initially the first one was in 2005 so we've. Um, often we have 50 or more reviewers from all over the world meeting up to 80 artists. They have one-to-ones, maybe 20 minutes each throughout one or two days. Um, and the reviewers are professionals from all over the world. They are industry leaders of all kinds. So festival direct, biennial directors, curators, writers, um, commissioners of, of, of uh, you know, from The Guardian or from Financial Times or from major museums and galleries all over the world. Um, and they come together looking for new talent, but also just to have conversations about ideas. Um, so because of the pandemic, we moved online and we have held our first online event uh, a few weeks ago. We had 66 artists, 28 reviewers. We had 326 meetings in one day on Zoom and we use Picta as a place where people put their portfolios and we uh, masterminded it all together, mistress minded it all together with my team. 16 countries involved, you can see some of them there in the slide. The awards and main benefits of develop relationships, confidence building, receive guidance, possible opportunities to be seen and heard. Of course, as artists know, and we can appreciate um, it's extremely isolating to be an artist at any point of your career um, and especially now so this became a, a lifeline for many people and there's the, there's the review some of the participants Helen kindly participated uh, as one of our reviewers as well hope you enjoyed it um, something else quite special that uh, we organized during the pandemic that engaged with a huge number of artists and um, was kind of normal practice I guess uh, for some people but for us it's something very familiar in terms of participatory practice so on the um the day before a couple of days before the lockdown on instagram i launched a um launched a, a hashtag and invited all makers all image makers of all kinds from around the world to participate in documenting the impact of the coronavirus pandemic and um just see some of the images there that were submitted and still are coming through now. And we've asked them to par participate in documenting the impact of coronavirus pandemic, chatting the time before, after and during the lockdowns. The images submitted were astounding um, and they express important thoughts, feelings and the view of the world around us at this extraordinary time. As well as reflecting the impact of world events alongside recent cyclones, Black Lives, Black Lives Matter movements, alongside the real impacts of loneliness, creativity, bereavement, our relationships, nature, family, cities, the resurgence of gardening, DIY, baking, and um, making so much more. So through this project, we've invited people to look at us here in 2020 through an albeit shattered lens in a previously unforeseeable future um, and situation. We found ourselves instructed to stay at home, locked in a global curfew, apocalyptic narr narratives combined with dystopian futures and became re real possibilities as life as we knew it slowly faded into mem memory. So um, nearing the end, I could go on, but there's more to say. So we received over 35,000 submissions from over 90 countries. It's allowed us to see both the unity and diversity of the experience of this uh, absolutely um, common feeling between people from human beings, this global event from the NHS Louise. workers, uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I've lost <laughs> track. Too I, I just lost, re, re, <laughs> I've just realized the time. Uh, yeah, and, there's too um, much good stuff. So I I'll, mean, uh, maybe I play, cut, cut to play, the film. Cut to the film. Yeah, yeah, great. It is, so I just switch and share and play here we go
Thank you. Thanks for listening. Thank, thank you so much. I think we're going to uh, have to do this again with maybe three hours. Um, just amazed at everything that that you do at Quad. Um, and now I'd like to introduce everyone to the uh, extraordinary Farid Rukin, who is a member of Ruin Grouper and will talk to us um, about this collective. As, as I mentioned before, uh, there's, there's, there's some really amazing mini documentaries on IGTV, so you can really see the, the depth and breadth of this collective's work. Over to you. Thank you, Helen. Uh, thank you, everyone, that made it possible for me to be here and sharing uh, live with all of you because, like, I was looking at the list of who would be sharing the screen and not the stage right now, the screen with me. And it's kind of like I want to learn, I can learn a lot from everyone here. Uh, so I don't think I'm going to take that much time because like I'm more interested in, in, in uh, the discussion following after this, especially if like, you know, between us, but also uh, from those of you who are watching right now. Uh, as Helen said, like there's uh, in the IGTV of Creative United, there's all already like uh, a video that we made in 2015. I think it was like uh, that span kind of like uh, our journey from 2000, Ron Lupa's journey from 2000 to 2014. It was made in 2015. So there are several things, of course, that are not there, but like it's good. The video is 11, 10, 11 minutes. So uh, if anyone, uh, generous enough to give like 10 to 11 minutes uh, watching that, it would be good, but yeah, we can watch it anytime later. Uh, I'm just like going to, because I cannot assume that everyone knows Ruang Rupa. Ruang Rupa is like a Jakarta-based artist collective uh, founded in 2000. I'm not one of the founders, uh, disclosure. Uh, I knew them since around 2003, 2004, when I was still an architecture student. And then I was just like hanging out with them because like there's, those are the people who I found to be refreshing, talking about stuff that actually means a lot to me instead of stuff that I was getting from like, you know, formal, formal uh, education institutions, etc., etc. So uh, it was, like none of us actually thought that Rupa could last this long. Uh, and then uh, throughout the years, uh, we had several iterations. Uh, the last one would be Good School. It's a school uh, for informal educational platform that Ruang Rupa founded in the end of 2018 together with two other Jakarta-based collectives, uh, Serum and Grafis Suruhara. And then when we just found that one, uh, Good School, we got the opportunity to actually kind of like propose something for a documenta. Uh, the, they are that documenta, the big one in Kassel, Germany, every five years. And then, I don't know, chance has it, luck has it, or unluck has it. Uh, we got, it's not a proposal, we invited documenta back. Uh, whether documenta was interested in embarking a journey that we've been embarked on. Uh, on like, you know, Good School is a good example because it's a collective of collectives. We, we uh, built something together. We, we kind of like experimented uh, with how to govern resources together. So if you get ahead, you're not only getting ahead by yourself, not only even like by your group, but uh, larger than that. We're just like 
we're trying we've been trying to do that for a while and then uh, somehow we were thinking if documenta is part of it is part of that uh, journey it could be much more interesting maybe the journey you know like so the ball was in documenta of course at that moment and then funny enough they they said yes basically to 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 uh, Cut a long story short, and then uh, yeah, since then we've been uh, uh, yeah we've been kind of like embarking on a process that we 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 kind of set out a protocol for, but the process itself we could not uh, imagine how it would be beforehand. So right now it's in the middle of everything. Uh, uh, if you look into like Documenta website right now, there's a part for Documenta 15, uh, how we started with like nine Lumbung members, other initiatives from all over the place to work with us. So we didn't see it as like invited artists and we're curators, let's say, or artistic directors, but we just like kept on uh, extending this invitation to uh, more people we're interested to learn from, let's say. Uh, and then, yeah, let me share an image with you right now. Hopefully it works. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I hope it is clear enough for everyone. This is an, uh, an illustration that we made because like what so one of the credos that we're trying to do right now is like stories, not theories. So storytelling is something that we believe in uh, how to tell cosmologies, you know, like how Lum like uh, this is a illustration of Lumbung. Lumbung is a rice barn. This is kind of like a concept that we are using and, uh, and up until now it's a working title for Documenta 15. But uh, Lumbung is a cosp like, you know, understood it more deeply in the process. Like, we understand that uh, that concept or that, uh, uh, let's say, metaphor is not enough. Uh, the cosmology behind it is actually kind of like, uh, we need to retell that. You know, and then working with other people from other contexts, their cosmologies also are very, very vital in order to understand what they're doing, how, why they're doing what they're doing, like ourselves as well, like why we are doing the way we're doing things. And then, uh, like for example, in Mali, there's, there's something called Maya, uh, M A A Y A, uh, not exactly like but similar to Lumbung for example it has been translated to economy or, uh, and also other practices uh, and then how to understand that practice is not enough by just like understanding the concept but like the cosmology behind it and then stories is actually like a good uh, strategy or format to understand that instead of like you know explaining it re representationally or theoretically so uh, this kind of illustration we like to use. Uh, this is kind of like the collection of stuff that we've talked about between ourselves, uh, between the Lumbo members, etc., etc. Uh, it is not set in stone, of course, but this is kind of like a good way to cross pollinate between ourselves on what type of resources we have uh, and then how we can bank on it. You know, like, uh, and then I'm not talking in only financial sense, but uh, how we can sustain each other, sustain each other practice uh, by sharing all this kind of stuff uh, and considering as resources uh, and further question how we can use them together, co-govern, you know, like collectively govern, etc., etc. Uh, that's one, and another one that I want to show, maybe, it's good, is this one. Uh, in Documenta, we're trying to experiment with, 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 with what we know already, actually. Uh, 
we don't the modern project to be honest never been that successful in our context so uh like the separation of disciplines uh genres etc etc it never really work with us uh we never see the art world as compartmentalized like that we didn't really have separation between traditional art forms for example like you know like uh traditional dance and storytelling etc etc with video art with uh music video with uh, underground music scene etc so we kind of like celebrate all of that to, together maybe that's why we last up until now because we were young ones we're not that young anymore uh but how we actually try to think about documenta 15 not an exhibition that is the main e event or the main course and then everything else is garnish uh dessert or appetizers or anything that's supporting the uh, main course but we are talking about a lot of things all together from uh the beginning almost you know like education sustainability inclusivity uh, mediation we we find a lot of problems with those terms but uh, in order for us to because we didn't come from that background anyway that institution that that needs public program and admin and mediation for example so we're trying to understand where it comes from but also rethink that in in the same time uh, because because yeah again honestly we didn't come from that background but it, we 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 want to not criticize but showed how things are, are actually can be done differently and then our way is not the only way i have to say uh that's why we're more interested in bringing other things to the equation and how other people are doing other things in different ways uh but to touch upon the extractive or plantation structure Helen was starting with, we're trying to re kind of like rehash what an event like Documenta could play uh, in for context and practices like ourselves. And then we're not exclusive this way. We're not the only one who has okay. not been by Documenta in a, in a vital way, let's say. So All right. that's yeah, I think that's it. I'm, 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 I'm done. I have the same because we have like this. This is so difficult for me as well. <laughs> Speaking in the structure. Uh, uh, um, apologies, everyone. This is no a perfect, Thank perfect example much. of cultural difference. Uh, um, now we're going to move on to Salma, but I will say to Farid that I'm so thrilled that we're taping this so I can revisit and really think and anchor myself in everything you were saying. We have Salma and Salma um, is an amazing artist and we are working together on a project which will illustrate a lot of the themes in this conference and also illustrate really what art can do in terms of translating very difficult conceptual ideas and embodying them into uh, a, co a coherent symbol. So I'll go over to you, Sal. You're muted. You're muted, Salma. Sal, you're muted. Hi, yeah. Um, for this talk, I'll be talking about a project that me and Helen have been working on during lockdown. And um, I'll start it off by saying that um, I'm the I'm the founder of the Black Women's Conference, and it's like an event where I would go to events that was for um for black people. It was about black people, but it wasn't for black people. So 
I'll go to these events and then I'll um with the other en- attendees I'll analyze and um talk about the event that was meant to be for us but it, it really wasn't and that's the key question that I'm going to be starting off with this talk is um how do you address the situation of having an event for a particular type of people but you don't do the research and the event is um what you think what you think that um they would want so for um this project um, me and helen uh, we're looking at um how to um look at different forms of care and i started off um, looking at um, the the Black Madonna and um, what it represents, the symbol of the Black Madonna, what it represents, and how it um, compares to the image of um, the image of women in general, and particularly white women. So this is a nail salon project and it's um with it. Sal, can um, you so it's a it's a shall we have a conversation about it? Yeah, let's just have a conversation. Yeah, let's I'm, have I'm a conversation. It I can't do <laughs> it. I was just like, it's too, it's too, it's like, it's too complicated. Yeah. I know, I know, this is the problem. It's uh, too, so, it's, so. the thing, the thing about it is that it's because it's an ongoing project. I've not been exactly. able to, um, I know, and, and I know, and we step in, it. and this is, this is how I always work with these really complicated things. So I'll take over. This is a project where, Salma, I really wanted Salma to share an aspect of herself and her culture that I don't know anything about. And um, you, when the exhibition is on and finished, everyone will be invited to uh, come and experience it. Uh, and I think that is literally the thing about art that we need to remember is that art can communicate across cultures, across values, and provide a way of us meet all meeting each other where we don't have to talk about it. So Sal, your images are so beautiful. Shall we just scroll scroll down to the images? Um yeah, I've decided not to have any um text. Well, there is one uh, not have it text based because I wanted the um, audience to really look at and acknowledge the imagery I'm using and look at it as a, um, as a, I just wanted to keep it visual because the whole, the whole point of um, my practice is trying to create um, iconography that um, speaks to um, black people and Somali people. So, I've re- if you you'll see I've repeatedly used the same imagery and tried to figure out what compositions and what I want flow better and what it means by associating certain images with the other and the images I've used are of um the Black Madonna, um the Queen of Poland, and um textures from um paintings and textures from Somali clothing. And it's just to capture uh, like a flowing, a f- like a fluidity in a sense, like something that flows mm-hmm. and um, like all Let- movement, just basically I'm trying to capture movement. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Yeah. I, I will say as well, this is um, an, a, a, f- a dark futuristic project that's going to be a nail salon uh, where people can engage in art and it's going to be augmented as well. So it's a augmented reality project, futurist nail bar. Another image, 
I'm just going to whip everyone yeah, through. Yeah, girl, you might as well because I'm just like, <laughs> it's like I'm like, I'm just like, hey, um, this is meant this to is, be a gift now. <laughs> this is uh-huh. a gift. This is this is going to be like moving and popping, and you can be doing your nails in an art gallery. You'll be able to go into uh, nail salons on on the high street, do your nails, and experience the art. So this is also what for. Uh, Farad was talking about like mixing it up, breaking structures. We don't just have to go into a white box uh, to experience good art. We should be able to experience art everywhere for the people, among the people. And since this is about the art market, people should also be aware that the nail business is multi-million, <laughs> billion pound business. So we know that um, once we sort out our product, we will be able to start creating a new market. And um, is this is any more slides? Is this the end? Yes, there's a, a few more slides. There's okay, let's go. More. This is just, just a visual. Want... That's just I... a visual. Um, there's another visual. And I think there should be an audio file coming up soon. OK, so th- let's go. These are so beautiful. <laughs> Stop, stop, stop. <laughs> um, the audio was just to, um, because of the nail salon. I wanted Helen. Um, I was thinking about how, talking to Helen. How about um, how you could imp- incorporate like a wedding feel or to make it like into an environment that is caring and also you celebrating something at the same time so make it into like a safe space so it's like we're thinking about places where different people come together and and um celebrate stuff i'm finding it really hard to talk about it because it's it's something that um i'm still trying to make <laughs> yes. no, it's sorry. difficult to talk about honestly i think i've just completely but i have you know, that I I've, mean, completely, um, I've completely lost it. Let's let's move to to panel discussions because that yeah, is let's exactly this is exactly let's what I it, wanted. It. <laughs> it's actually what I wanted <laughs> to have uh, to have. Uh, where is everyone? To have something where we we just remember why we're all part of what we do and. Uh, why we do what we do and why why art is so important and um yeah the market is important too but but and we all need to eat but it shouldn't be controlling how we do things and i really wanted to bring everyone here today because everyone on the panel today made amazing things happen during lockdown from their own particular art institutions when so many other galleries were um, just shutting down and in panic. And I really believe that came from being based into this need for care and the duty to care for our various communities. I will move to a question that uh, Farid has asked the panel. And Farid has asked, is it possible not only to imagine, but to put in practice an art market that is not based on bilateral transactions in order to question individualism further? And I'd like to put this to Louise, this notion of um, how, how we can trade in a different way to have lives in which we thrive. That's a complex question. I'd like to. Um, so, Farid, when when you mean bilateral transactions, can you can you expand on what that means more precisely, and then I can uh, get my. Uh, it's bilateral transactions. So it's <laughs> like uh, when you buy something, like when you buy something, you expect the other one to uh, the other party to. Uh, to provide you with something instead of uh, either goods or service, no? 
So it's like that's that's transaction, and then it's from one party to another, not like uh, with the rest of the things that this person can bring, like collectivity. Basically, that's where I'm coming from, of course. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's certainly more possible in in the spheres where I operate because we are uh, publicly funded here as a as a facilitator for people to support and um, collaborate with each other for for no financial gain specifically. Obviously, we need to work at a financial model that is sustainable, and that's even more impossible right now because of the, the pandemic, of course. But um, certainly the example that I talked about in my uh, my slide <laughs> takeover was um, Marinella Senatori, who uh, operates on a, yeah, of course there is a budget, but in terms of Skillshare and the 15,000 people that were involved in that project um, was incredible. So people learned hairdressing, they, taxi drivers were, you know, we were asking them what else do you do? And some of them, you know, could weld metal when they came and did a masterclass for the art students and people in, in terms of um, defining art skills. And I think it's something interesting that within your practice that comes across through what I've read on the internet, obviously around um, kind of how you engage with people and society and something beyond the art world and the art market or what is recognized as art or what art is and can be and how you integrate into society and how people can learn from each other and how an artist can be everybody this man walking past on the street you know you don't have to produce consumable objects to be an artist and that is very possible in many situations and we facilitate um, that context I, I i really like oh hello Luz. i <laughs> really like what um farad had been saying in the presentation because it's very close to my culture and how we think in that there isn't this separation of art and high art and low art i mean we have a culture of the festival and every single person on the island can become an artist and take part in this festival and it is through the sharing of resources that money flows through the system right so so suddenly um when you are of, of value to your community your community will support you but what what happens in the art world in in the west is uh, artists who are doing really good stuff get extracted out of their communities and they just join the international art world. And then the value that that artist can bring go, just goes again to this imperial top. And so the question is, how can you remain rooted as an artist without being extracted out? So that the value that you're creating in the international community flows back into your own world and to answer Farad's question that there are quite a few artist groups who are breaking these models um I know loose spur group set up by Joey Holder and Megan Broadmeadow during lockdown two well-known artists who have started a residency for young artists so having this recycling of money and I know Lucy would have some examples as well Uh, what's it called the you're on mute Luce? Lucy on mute the uh, artist resale pledge is that what it's called yeah that's something that's um been happening and I think probably the audience will be um quite familiar with artist re uh, artist support pledge where artists um are supporting there's a, ne a network of artists supporting the sale of each other's work I'll put a link in um in the chat for it for everyone um, and we also were talking Helen a bit about um, a um, some the way in which um, there's been kind of talking reports on how um, many kind of black artists as they've been finding success in the art market particularly recently um, 
that they are kind of putting those resources back into um, supporting the next generation of artists of colour. And I thought there were some really interesting models, particularly in the US, um, that are emerging around that. I mean, absolutely, absolutely. As as people of color and artists of color, we we always tend to be thought of to be in community, and this is something where that I wanted to illustrate with my work uh, that I showed uh, with Megan Broadmeadow, where I took a community. Uh, so Farad might not know this, but Farad, Farad, one of the structures that I would really like to see break is you have this concept of high art or good art, and that's the art that's seen in the gallery. But around most museums and galleries, you have public programs, and those are community artists working with the community. And the two never meet. So if you are a wealthy person, you can walk into so many of these galleries and you'll never know walking into the gallery that the gallery had hosted uh, a luncheon for the elderly people in the community. And it's this separation, which is, I think, particular to the plantation system and this me mechanistic system um, that is causing uh, this uh, e extractive economy, right? Because things are siloed instead of flowing in and out of each other for, for no good reason. Does that, does that help with your question? Yeah, and then <laughs> thank you very much. This, this, the second question, I'm going to uh, leave Salma's for last, because it, it's very personal. Um, the second question Louise wanted to ask um, uh, to uh, Farid is, um, and I'm not sure, I'm just going to read what you wrote, Louise, and you can elaborate on it. Why in lowercase letters? And then we understand works together to activate art in the broader cultural environment. What kind of culture, public or audience, do you focus on engaging with? And how can art engage in a real way with public social concerns? Uh, yeah, what well, the lower case is just like stylized, to be honest. Before it was like Rupa is because uh, we, it's like two words brought together and then it just looks better. My take on it, this is like looks better with, 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 with lowercase instead of a big R. And then, uh, yeah, but then I, I was also kind of like, but this is when I was younger, like uh, talking in English, the I, the, the, the capital I, uh, it was kind of like um, our, well, not only me, I mean, like our, uh, when I said we this time, it's like Indonesians maybe at large, it's like, why do we have to say I in a capital letter, you know? Uh, and then, because we didn't have that. And then I, I, I believe a lot of languages also don't have that. So it's kind of like, uh, if it could say humility it could be that but also like of course it's contradictory contradictory because like then we have to say that it's like you know like we have to be written that way all the time uh, uh, in order to be uh, consistent uh, but then what type of things if I understand your question correctly uh, <clears throat> it's it's like other things that uh, that has happened beyond or like independently from uh, both things like the market, the global art market as we call it or local art market, but basically like buying and selling artworks, but also like uh, also independent from the state uh, supports. Uh, this type of precarious practices uh, 
most of the time it surpassed that question that Helen was talking about anyway, you know, the separation from art and life, all those kind of stuff. They couldn't afford that to begin with. So it's kind of like they don't separate from the context that they're working with a lot of, again, not a lot of times, not always, but uh, those type of practice we are interested in. So it's not only, that's why also we, a lot of us build spaces because uh, because that's kind of like the, the what we need in order to support what we and other peoples around us are doing, no? Because we don't have it. So space is a contestation of 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 ideologies, all those kind of stuff. Just like not only being talked about and represented, but actually being happening and practiced directly on day to day basis. I hope it starts to answer. I hope I understand the question properly. <laughs> Can I ask a question of you, Farid, as well? I'm just um, um, interested to kind of um see or explore whether there are whether there are any tensions between your kind of form of practice and then the, the notion of working with documenta as a kind of major international fe festival in some ways like a kind of gatekeeper as it were within the arts ecology um i wondered uh, aside from your, your your brilliant art and practice like if you could maybe just say a bit like why you think documenta wanted and you uh to Ruan Ruan Grupa to be the curators if that makes sense like why they need you because I I, I think they uh, do. <laughs> uh yeah it's like one and a half years ago I have to recall but uh I cannot answer it for the institution itself no because yeah they have answers maybe I, uh. I don't know uh I don't know the full picture of it but I think like uh, uh, what I heard from the, from the finding committee members, for example, it's like uh, when we when we kind of like that interviewed on on this position for this position, like the others are like the other candidates, let's say, uh, were actually like laying the groundwork for us already because like. The, a lot of people are thinking maybe right, right now to uh, to go further than representation of activism, you know, or performing activism. Mm -hmm. And then this is before pandemic times. But during pandemic times are actually like kind of like, it's easier to be honest. Like one of the thing that I'm, I, I, that is positive out from the current moment is like it's easier to knock on people's door and say that things need to be different uh, compared to before. Like this, again, like like you know, like this song is not a new song for us. Uh, it's just like uh, more people are 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 in tune right now. <laughs> um, I was um really uh, struck um, by the thought that where, where we are now, uh, one way to conceptualize it is as if we're in a war, that we're in World War Four, And uh, one of the questions from the audience, uh, from Amrita, so like Amrita is part of Dark Futurist group, that Salma and I have formed. And we sort of formed Dard to try and think about how to create a new future and what that would look like. And, and that is what I think artists are very good at, right? Creating sort of images, speculative images and that allow us to orient ourselves to a new way of being and working. And I wondered if um, maybe Louise, if you think about um, if you if think about futurisms in your practice, or are you just on 
how to just make things happen in the moment. Mm. No, very much about thinking into, into beyond and trying to imagine possible futures. Um, just technically also with our program, we need to think about four or five years in advance. So we have to <laughs> tackle that head on um, through our funding structures, but also it's, a, it's an incredible way of working and, and thinking. And we've been practicing that for, for over 20 years now. So it's, um, it's kind of part of my, my nature to think ahead and try to research as much as possible and have as many discussions. And often uh, with technology, we're trying to do things that aren't possible yet as well and being very frustrated about that. But, um, but also with, with um, new structures, this, this pandemic time has been an absolute reset button and a wake up call for, for, for um, inequalities and uh, thinking about different, f different futures are possible. And um, of course, with uh, working in, in multiple ecologies around the world, I, I learned so much from, from different ways of, of being and doing. So um, of course, we're thinking about how to apply that and transform here. There's a time lag, of course, with uh, local structures and uh, other things, but being independent, we can be fairly light of foot and being outside of a um, capital city we can we can be more uh, dynamic and take more risks and um, be more experimental but all that said you know we still get um, uh, some of the ideas get delayed through various structures but the ideas are, are, are no there's no um, shortage of uh, <laughs> future thinking and, and also we in, engage with people in our program not just to show and present but also to challenge and to, to think ahead so um, of course yes this is one of the most exciting and enjoyable parts of uh, this kind of career to to engage with that thinking ahead and trying to apply it and trying to do it and trying to test and platform and all these things for sure yeah i'm so, I'm so excited to see um what Salma, what, what you do with your work, and of course, uh, Farid as well, to, uh, to kind of see where you're heading and yes, hear more about your thoughts on this too. You're muted, Helen. There was a question in chat, I think Lucy can answer, which was about the 6,000 figure. Someone asked, was that, the extra money that artists make from their work or was that what they made during the year? Um, it's So it was over the year specifically from their artistic practice from what I can remember. That figure comes from a report which um, AN um, did with Arts Council England and I put a link to it in the chat actually um, right at the okay. start. Um, about the livelihoods of um, artists so you can kind of the all the detail and breakdown is there um, in the chat. and there, there's a there's another one Helen here in the Q&A from Artie Check um, uh -huh. I don't know if you've seen it but um, no I haven't seen it shall I read it out yeah sure um, so it I can, and I think this is for one for the panel generally, I, I can see opportunities to democratize the art market by creating new models that are supported not by the wealthy, but by micro transaction in part for good causes, but it helps to give a gift or object or merchandise for these types of projects. This is still transactional, but I wonder if we need that bridge. Can you comment? So this is maybe also relating to Farid, what you were saying about that kind of bilateral kind of transactional thing, but also, yeah, trying to think uh, yeah, whether there, there is a kind of a, a middle ground with some of this. Hmm. I, I, I'm so, so, and Lucy, uh, I mean, I don't know what you think, uh, Farid. I, I'm not a fan of the microtransaction. I tend to embed every everything I do within a physical object that's affordable, that's affordable. So I tend to be a fan of the idea of editions and multiples that are affordable to everyone. But I don't know, it'd be interesting to hear what other panelists, um, Farid, if you think about microtransactions, uh, We haven't experiment, well, we've, we tried to experiment with that, but it didn't, well, maybe it's because of the scale. Well, it didn't work really well for us. But I was like, maybe much more interested in hearing uh, the thoughts of like Salma who are working, like at least the work I've seen tonight, you know, like how 
can an artist like you uh, use? What type of 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 what type of ecosystem can sustain your type of practices? Maybe that's my question. Um, selling merch or additions. How, how does the nails okay. work? You um, literal think, nail painting. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I've been like researching how to um, put, you know, like, cause it's like a sad <laughs> business that you can get into where you buy acrylics like sets and then you put the artwork on it and then it's like custom made business. So that's how um, people make money of making um, off nails so there's like loads of things that you can make money off if you go on ASOS you see like loads of like cheap acrylic nails that you can get that aren't I think it's like a, tr a trend now where it's more versatile and there's more options than it used to be like maybe like maybe 15 or so years ago I think it was like it's a very like black women culture thing but now has become mainstream because everything black currently is mainstream. But um, for me personally, I think for an artist, the only way for me to survive is to actually think about how can I, with an exhibition, what can I sell with it? Like, I have to think of, like, I have to be like, how would a musician operate? If they were putting on a gig, they'll sell their merchandise so that's the mentality that i've got to be thinking of that's it selma is is speaking my my language i'm i'm like I, I, but also because this is what this technology enables you know, five years ago, it would be impossible for us to think about doing augmented nails, right? Um, because uh, the, the, you, Salma and I would have to go and rent a factory in China to make the molds, produce the, the nails, uh, do a massive order of 4,000 um, 4, nails to, to then trial it out in a market. Now, if you understand how digital works, all of this stuff can be done digitally. You can send the file to the nails, to, to the nail people, and it, they can print it on. So understanding new technologies and how uh, new media te technologies and how they shorten the route to market, I, for me, is the, the key towards uh, flipping, flipping this, uh, art market but before we do that we have to destigmatize uh product yeah. and i think i'm reading the audience there was an amazing artist sal i don't know if you remember and he had done this amazing juice with the, with a label a hand-painted label and they were selling for uh maybe just over what you would buy a a, a drink for and I thought that was a really beautiful product because it's something I could give as a gift. If I, if I don't want to bring wine to someone's house, I could bring some artist packaged, you know, water. And, and I, I think we need to uh, be thinking about merchandise and merchandising. And, uh, but when I say we, I don't mean uh, sort of thinkers such as Louise, who are so busy already thinking about these big sort of macro things. I mean, we need to be doing this from the ground and rooted to the ground instead of expecting money to be gifted to us because as, a, as an artist of color and a woman of color, it's just not going to happen. I think also, I think that um, artists need to think about like, okay, then think about it like this. How can I um, put my artwork on different things and see it like that? So, okay, so you've got it, you're selling a bottle. It's got a label. Your artwork's got to go on the label. So 
like for like the nail salon as we were thinking about it it's like different you can put your artwork in different formats it, you, and the more experimental you become the more likely you can make more money if you think about it in that sense not even about money it is really about money because no one wants to live a broke bitch life um so you got to think about it like how it's a challenge as well okay then okay then I want to sell like canvas bags, the most easiest things that people have always been doing for like how many years now? Think about it. Okay, then my artwork's going to go on that. Well, I'll make money off that. So, like we were talking about how the nail salon, if it's a poster as well, it's on the nails as well. So, we're making affordable art in a sense. So, people can buy it at a cheaper rate, but then the challenge of it is it's a different type of object that you've not well I've not um, designed on before how is it going to look like and there's all these other challenges and I think artists need to be thinking like how can I flip it but what I like about the uh, the nail art though is it's it, it kind of rather than seeing it as merchandise it's it's an artwork that then surfs the world around like whoever's wearing it on their hands if they put it on if they don't keep it in a drawer locked as an artwork then it actually uh, in infiltrates into like everyday situations you can see it as people as a kind of a, a, a living exhibition that kind of migrates around and you can play with that as well rather than obviously it, it can give you a little bit of money but it's uh, the ideas are still kind of within the Rather than doing, you need to do something that's that relates to your ideas, rather than just for money, maybe. Or you know, we all need to survive, don't we? How about um, Ruan Gupa? Is there is there any? Um, do you do you live from monetizing your ideas purely, or and facilitating social situations, or is it um, if you uh, found a way to ob make uh, objectify your and uh, commercialize somehow? Yeah, we, we have a shop already. I think like it was, for example, you know, like uh, so merchandises and these merchandises and others can be sold there. Even like under uh, current circumstances, it became like vegetables as well, you know, because that's part of our ecosystem. And then more, more people need to cook and then cook healthy, cheaply, or all those kind of stuff. So it changes, of course, uh, based uh, but also like uh, I think like because we didn't separate design and art either so we kind of like easily go towards that type of not only goods but services uh, that we can give so uh, and then like our neighbors we like thinking about like how to how to survive not only us as ourselves and then you know like a prop uh our plot of land let's say but like next door uh like from shops to housewives what can we do with them so that's i think like in indonesia at least like the notion of uh cooperative co-op uh was like lost it's lost its it's it's momentum when it got urbanized so in urban urban setting it was it's not it's not popular anymore but actually right now and then you know learning from other places helps why it happened all those kind of stuff but we are re, uh, we are revisiting that as well and on how actually what we what we are doing right now uh, all those kind of stuff the if we think about it as value, the one that can monetize that value the most, actually like the platform owners, like, you know, YouTube, Google, all those kind of stuff. Uh, if a cooperative is actually like giving back the ownership of uh, the means of production to the labor itself, maybe it's time for us to do that as well. Uh, those who has been benefiting from us because they own something then we need to own it again you know like although it's of course it's easier etc but uh, it's easier to go the other way let's say almost at the end um 
chat got Q and A got very exciting. Um, <laughs> uh, but we, <laughs> I don't know, Lucy, would you like to? Um, I'm going to be in the chat afterwards if people would like to join us and continue the conversation. Yeah. So there, um, yeah, there's a few. I think this this topic is uh, around merch and those sales models to set off a kind of yeah chain of conversation in the Q and A, and it'd be great to continue that in video lounges, and there'll be uh, information with a link post on that in the chat. And I think there's kind of some questions that have come up around the relationship of this to like a resurgence of cooperative models um, is also coming through re responses to platform capitalism, things like that. And there's been a question around blockchain in the uh, in relation to facilitating um, kind of democratization of the arts, so, as it were, and so on in the chat. So all these kind of topics, I think, can pick up in the video lounges and talk about more if people have time. Um, uh, is it time for me to read closing instructions? I think it might be, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> okay. Closing instructions. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I have to write it down. Acknowledgements. Okay, I would love to thank everyone at Creative Scotland, Creative United, UCL. I'd love to thank my amazing speakers coming from so many different perspectives, grappling with this very difficult problem that no one really likes to think or talk about. Um, to, to mention again that all links and resources in the discussion are in chat. And to say that um, we, I'm going to be uh, in video lounge to continue the conversation and that it is unmoderated so anyone can suggest a topic and join the discussion around topics. Please bear in mind the safe space guidelines and I would like to say thank you everyone. Uh, go out and practice care in the world. It is the secret to everything. <laughs> How we take care of everyone. And um, thank you very much. Thank you to all the panelists. Oh, thank you. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. You'll be hearing from me, all of you. Faradam coming to Documenta and so Indonesia we... with Salma. <laughs> <laughs> uh, please go out to in touch and let me know. It would be nice. I will. To meet you. We will. <laughs> we'll come right, and do nails. You. We'll come oh, yeah, and do nails. our nail salon yeah. in <laughs> Indonesia. That would be so good. Yeah, that would be amazing. <laughs> it would be amazing. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye